Hi, this is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. Welcome to Media Church. This week, we're continuing our 52-week baseline Bible study. Now, there is a printed version of these studies, and it's in this book. You can go to fathersheartmedia.com to acquire this in paperback form, and it's also there in ebook form as well. Uh, <coughs> I don't know we have the price on it somewhere. I think it's $21.95, and the ebook version is $9.95. And if you had the printed version, you could go along uh, with the lesson each week and also have it to peruse throughout the week. This week we're talking about what it is to be a child of God. All Christian religions have a baseline requirement that men must fulfill in order to be uh, blessed of God and to be accepted by Him. It's their idea of what it means to be right with God. This is their creed or their truth. Many teach that God requires great personal sacrifice as the means of securing eternal bliss. Others propose that all men are God's children and all you must uh, give a uh, is a, a general assent to something uh, that approximates the golden rule in order to be a person who's satisfying the divine requirement. Still others, other groups, what, 16,000 Christian denominations and groups, place importance on doctrinal nuance or outward conformity to certain religious standards. Uh, with Pilate, with Pontius Pilate, we could ask the question, uh, what is truth? Does it matter how we live or what we believe? Is God only looking for sincerity of intent? By its very nature, truth is mutually exclusive. There can be only one truth. Yet, as we shall see in this chapter, truth is not a set of doctrines or teachable principles. Truth is much, much more than this. Relativism, or the belief that what is true for you is not necessarily true for another, is one of the greatest lies that Satan has perpetuated in modern society. It is often said, it doesn't matter what you believe, just so you are sincere. There can only be one truth, however. One creator, one dogma that all men are called everywhere to embrace. The myriads of religions and even hundreds of Christian religions are a tribute not to God's diversity, but a manifestation of man's myopia or inability to see, accept or embrace the broad perspective of the kingdom of God and the one great truth that is the underpinning of all Christian faith. In order to sort through the varied opinions and to get at truth, you must first accept Scripture as authoritative on all matters pertaining to the Christian walk. The Word of God must be accepted as a book that always points us to Christ and contains objective truth, or the Bible just becomes the articulation of religious truth Principles that are merely convenient for the moment, making it say whatever you want it to say at the time. It has to be accepted then that the Bible is an infallible expression of the truth that God has chosen to communicate to humanity. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 19 to 21 say this, We have a more sure word of prophecy Whereunto you do well to take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Now here is the understanding of divine inspiration. But as holy men of old spake, as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost, while the Bible expresses truth, you have to understand that the deeper reality is that Jesus himself 
personifies truth. There's a difference between that which expresses truth and that which personifies truth. Expressed truth does not save you. It is the personified truth that brings you into a right relationship with God and Jesus is the truth personified. While the Bible expresses truth, the way of life that Jesus came to establish in the first century was not centered on the Bible, but it was centered upon himself. We didn't have the New Testament then. All we had was the Old Testament. And if the Old Testament was the means of salvation, Jesus didn't need to come. The Word of God expressed in the Bible is the clothing of the Word of God personified in Jesus. Jesus did not die to give us a book called the Bible. He died to give us himself and to bring us into a personal relationship with him. Therefore, true Christianity is more of a relationship than a philosophy, lifestyle, or teachable religion. You can live a Christian lifestyle, hold to its philosophy, practice Christian religion, and still not be a child of God. A personal relationship with Jesus is what validates you as a child of God, regardless of the correctness of your philosophy, lifestyle, or religion. Consequently, you can conclude that a personal relationship with Jesus, then, is the minimal requirement of true Christianity in your life. You should not stop there, however. To have all the other aspects of Christianity in full bloom in your life, however, means nothing in the eyes of God if you are lacking in this one area of necessary relationship. But, if you have a true relationship with Jesus, it will be impossible for you not to develop a philosophy of life, a lifestyle, and a religious sense that's pleasing to God. If you have children, consider the basis on which you accept them. You feed, clothe, and house them because you accept them. They're yours. They're not the kids next door. However, you may not always approve of them. You love them, and you're there for them. But sometimes you need to deal with them from a position of disapproval, even though you continue to accept, feed, clothe, and house them as your children. When your children act in disapproval, there are privileges you withhold for the purpose of teaching, discipline, and setting standards. In fact, there are times you totally disapprove of your children's actions while in the same breath you never stop feeding them, housing them, or clothing them. Why? Because you, as God the Father, take responsibility for your children because they're your children and you accept them as such. Religion says God rejects you because of disobedience. That's a despicable lie. He loves you. He accepts you. He will feed, clothe, and house you and care for you. There are things that accrue to you because he accepts you, and there are things that accrue to you because he approves of you. We comfort and rest in the, in the confines of the parameters of his acceptance, and we're in pursuit of his approval. That's the wholesome Christian life. Matthew 7, 11 says, If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, you know how to take care of your own, doesn't God take care of his own? How much more will your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Why? Because you're righteous? No, you're not righteous. Uh, you're not, you're not uh, in and of yourself by your performance. You're not earning. Your child does not earn the right to sit at your table. He sits at your table because he's your child, even if he's been bad, even if he doesn't uh, enjoy your approval at that given point. You see, the Father of your soul deals with you in the same way you deal with your own children. You can be totally accepted of God as his child, even though he may disapprove of your lifestyle at any given moment. Even though you are being disciplined, the Father still cares for you. There is a such thing as the woodshed of God. There are basic promises and blessings that are yours, however, simply because you're his child. Matthew chapter 6, verse 27 and 29 says, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature. So why take thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, they don't perform. They're not trying to please anybody. Neither do they spin. But I say that even Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed as one of these. Some parents mistakenly say, 
that's not my little boy. My little boy would not do thus and so. God never does that. What he says is, you're my child, and I love you, but I will not allow you to walk in my full blessing until this changes in your life, and you'll know exactly what that is. Hebrews 12, 9 and 10 says this, Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which have corrected us, and we gave them reference. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For verily they for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. The Father deals with you then on two very different levels. He deals with you mutually in terms of acceptance, but also approval. There are baseline benefits that accrue to you simply because you're his child and he accepts you. Real growth and fulfillment, however, only come to you as you go beyond spiritual infancy and seek his approval in your life. Your acceptance before God is secured by your new birth. The approval of the Father, therefore, is based on obedience and ongoing submission. So what is the basis of the Father's acceptance then? 1 Peter 2.5 says, You are a lively stone built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God. You see, your acceptability to God is secured through the person of Jesus. Because of what Christ has done on the cross and who he is, you are accepted in the Father's family. You cannot diminish or augment your standing in the family of God by who you are or what you've done or what you have not done in life. You are acceptable to God through Christ and you are approved of God through your actions. This is the difference between Father's acceptance and his approval. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The word for faith here is confidence. If your children, your children, did not trust you, you would be displeased. You would not disown them, but you would disapprove of that unfounded distrust. As a parent, after all your labor and work to provide a home and supply their needs, you would expect your children to have a certain level of trust in you. Likewise, you must understand that you meet the Father's approval through your trust in His nature and His faithfulness. There are rewards from God's hand that will be withheld from you until you begin to seek His approval in your life through developing trust in him. At the same time, however, you are still accepted as his child, and he's providing for you, however, on that basis. No matter how, what kind of a rascal you are, how immature you are, how many times he has to change your spiritual diapers, he still accepts you and loves you. But he wants you to grow in confidence and trust in him to garner his approval to be launched into your destiny. Serving the Father's purpose in your life will place you at His disposal and serve His highest purpose, even if that purpose is fulfilled at your own personal expense. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. The sinner's prayer is based upon the above scripture. When someone becomes a Christian, this verse is the invitation that should be cited. The believer, the prospective believer, then makes a declaration that his life is now committed to the Lordship of Jesus. It's a discipling process as much as it is a decision. As a sinner, you, you would now, as a prospective believer, commit the whole of your life over to God's loving care, and God takes responsibility to define the parameters of that care to you on a daily basis. through believing that God raised Jesus from the dead. If he raised Jesus from the dead, he can raise you up out of the mess you've made of your life. If that prayer is prayed in utter sincerity and from the heart, there is a creative miracle that takes place. As an individual, you become born again from the dry husk of, the, of a dead human spirit. A new human spirit emerges indwelling itself by the Spirit of God, the Christ in you. 
The Holy Spirit within that human spirit, within your human spirit, will then go about securing your borders as the personal domain and property of the kingdom of God which brings righteousness, peace, and joy in every area of your life from the cradle to the grave and into eternity. God bless you. We look forward to next week.